Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's, uh, Chicago Metro always does such a great job, and we really appreciate this fall, this uh, spring conference, and they do some great things in the fall. They do some good things, too. It's so great to have all this local, uh, local chance to get your contact hours, so it's, it's wonderful. This one doesn't work? Okay, I'll try that one. All right, let's see what happens. Let's try that one. No? That's okay, I'll just use the one on the... Yep, that's all right. I can use that one. It's okay. This should work. Okay, that will work. All right, good. We're in business. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, sexual dysfunction this morning. I'm going to go over a lot of different things, but if there's something in particular you want to talk about, and you can stop me at any time, let me know. Um, there's so much we could talk about. We could do like an all-day conference on this. So uh, if you want to talk more about premature ejaculation and some questions about that, or you want to talk a little bit more about peronies or other things, we can certainly zero in because I tried to focus on the bigger things and so we'll see what you think. But anyway, so if we went around the room and we asked everybody about sex and intimacy, we would probably hear lots of people talk about different things. And if we said, well, how would you define sex? We would probably have, everybody in here would have a different definition is how it would probably go. Um, so, but some of it is, is intrinsic. You're born with that sense of being male or female, right? DNA kind of turns things into a certain thing, and so there's that intrinsic part. But it is multidimensional, because we, when we look across cultures, we see that in places like Asia, we st people start having sex at a completely different age than they have it here. So you see differences in culture, so some of it's culturally derived, and I think pretty much every single thing um, in your life could affect what you think about sex. But when we talk about sex, um, in particular here, when we're talking about sexual dysfunction or sexual function, we're talking about any kind of genital stimulation for pleasure. So not just intercourse, a lot of people think of intercourse when they think of, of sex, but we're talking about any genital stimulation for pleasure. So when we talk about it, that's what we mean. And then intimacy, I like Hatfield's definition, the process by which two people attempt to move towards complete communication on all levels, a deeper, more profound communication, not just verbal or nonverbal, but sort of that deep communication that exists, that connectedness that happens between two people that feel seen and heard and valued by each other. So intimacy and sex are two different things, but they kind of work hand in hand, right? And so the thing about it is when we're pulling things apart, we want to understand what, are the, what is the patient looking for in terms of sex and intimacy? So a couple <clears throat> is having a fight and they're not speaking to each other. Raise your hand if you think they can have sex. Of course, people have sex all the time when they're fighting. <laughs> right? But could they have intimacy? No, because you can't really have communication on all levels when you're not speaking on a basic level. So you could have sex, but you may not have intimacy. So they work hand in hand, but the thing about it is sometimes one can exist without the other. And we want to know the patient's goals in terms of both intimacy and sex so we can help them reach their goals ultimately. You know, you can read the definition of sexual dysfunction, but it's some sort of impairment or persistent difficulty with uh, their usual patterns of sexual interest and or response. And then this is the most common thing, so what I'm going to spend the time on, but I'm happy to go over to, if you want to flip over to premature ejaculation or one of the other topics, just let me know. But, and basically, we have a, a, a classic definition of it, and you'll see the first words are the classic definition, and then the more recent um, AUA guidelines add these second words. I think what's important is that we're not, again, we're not talking about intercourse. We're talking about sexual performance and satisfaction. Can they get and stay hard enough for sexual performance and satisfaction? That's really what we're talking about when we talk about erectile dysfunction. And we know this is the thing that brings these men in our office. Lifetime risk is about one in five. So about a little less than 20% of men in their life will have problems. But by the time men are 70, what percent of men will have trouble with erectile dysfunction? Anybody know? 70. About 70%. So as you get into those older ages, it kind of matches with the age. So, and it's not necessarily because of aging, although aging does, I mean, it really does throw some, <laughs> some 
I, we always say, if you don't have a good sense of humor, you are in trouble with aging. Because, you know, the other day I'm eating my meal and I cracked a tooth. I'm just like, seriously. I'm like, bit by bit, parts are falling off of me. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's just scary. But, um, so, yes, aging has a role in it. But you will meet patients, and I'm sure Vic and some of us who work with erectile dysfunction patients, we've met guys who have good function and are older, but usually they don't have diabetes and high blood pressure and cholesterol issues. They're in phenomenal shape and they're still getting really good erections. So remember, those comorbid conditions are even more important than aging, but this is the problem that brings them in, and this is the thing that we see most often. And even in our younger patients, we'll see sometimes about 5 to 10 percent of men in their 20s and 30s may have difficulties with erectile dysfunction, and that's why I'm spending most of my time talking about that. Masters and Johnson, they created this linear thing. So it starts with excitement or desire. So we start to feel more. The pulse increases. The blood pressure increases. We get tactile sensation. The blood moves to the surface so we can feel more. The vagina widens. The vagina deepens uh, with, with that desire and excitement. And it moistens. And the male gets hard. The erection gets hard as well. And then we kind of reach this wonderful plateau area where like, Wow, this feels really good. A lot of people like to hang out in the plateau and delay the orgasm a little bit because it feels really nice. Everything feels so good. You're feeling so much on the skin. And also, you may be feeling a great amount of connectedness. And then the orgasm occurs. For men, then resolution occurs. For women, they may have multi-orgasms. But if you didn't see, we have a little problem here. And this is why premature ejaculation. So physiologically, really, men ejaculate or climax four times quicker than their female partners. That's just, that's one of Oprah's oh, aha moments, right? So it's just a fact of life. So I tell my patients, all men have to learn to delay climax. And by the time you're having intercourse, she should either be orgasming or on the brink of orgasm. That's what foreplay is really about the female because she's gonna take four times longer. And then remember, Masters and Johnson, they paid people to have sex in front of them. How do you get that through an IRB? That's what I wanna know. I mean, they're always looking at my IRB stuff and I'm like, really? They paid people to have sex right in front of them and, but they learned a lot and we'll probably never be able to do studies like this again. But this is really important information. Four times it takes longer. So think about your woman who are, your female patients who are on SSRIs or they're on something that delays even further. So any kind of psych medicine is going to change the way you feel and sense, right? Any kind of pain medicine is going to change the way you sense, and that's why they can delay time to climax. And your female patient already takes four times longer. She's paired with a male in this circumstance. Think of what it's going to be like for her on sertraline or um, clomipramine or something that's causing a delay in climax, or even on tramadol for chronic pain. So. Very linear model, desire and then arousal. Oh, this feels really good. And then, wow, let's hang out here as long as we can because when this is over, the man's going to roll over and fall asleep, right? <laughs> and the woman's like, wait, I have these other things that could be really enjoyable. Please don't go to sleep yet. So again, female, what most men do, and this is again just a fact of life, is the female partner is already right at the door or she's gone through it and ready for more. And that's where it should be by the time intercourse. If you want to have that simultaneously orgasming things, it's got to occur that way. It's probably not going to happen any other way. So that's really important. But Rosemary Bassan did this research, and, she, and I love this model, and I use it even more than Masters and Johnson. And the reason is, is because she looked at women, and she found when she looked at the women, she said, it starts with desire. So tell me about how that is for you. And a th over a third of the women said, it doesn't start with desire. And she's like, hmm, that's interesting. So it doesn't start with desire in over a third of the women that she talked to. So they said, no, it's not like this physical thing where I want to have sex and, that's what, and then I go, oh, let's have sex. It starts with emotional intimacy and engagement. Connect with me. Get me, let me feel that energy that exists between us when I feel connected to you. And now I'm thinking, hmm, okay, let's kiss, let's touch. 
this feels really good, and way over here, yeah, I'm having a physical desire to be intimate with you. And this feels really good and I feel even more engaged and round and round it goes. I really like this model because when we're trying to tease apart what's going on with your patient, because men with erectile dysfunction sometimes will say, I don't have a desire, I don't, I'm, not, I'm having sex. In fact, a lot of them are saying, I'm having sex with my wife once a month or once a week or however often. Well, does he have a desire disorder? How can we tell? We have to ask him about, do you think about sex? If you see something sexual, do you have sexual thoughts? And men think about sex every single day of their life. So usually he'll say, yes, I do. I have sexual thoughts all the time. And sometimes I think about the fact that I can't perform, which is really upsetting to me. This is really important because this man doesn't have a testosterone desire issue in all likelihood, although we'll still look at testosterone because the AUA guidelines say we should and the endocrine guidelines, so we will look at it but it's not probably what's causing the problem here because he has a pretty good drive. And in fact, when you ask him how often are you self-stimulating, he is doing that regularly every week and maybe a couple times a week. So desire's not the problem, but the thing is, is he's not doing it because he's thinking, oh, I can't function. You know, why do I want to start something that I can't finish? And again, we're programmed to think sex is all about how, what is going all the way? And we're not there till we get all the way or we get all the way to home base, right? That's intercourse, but it's not the only way. I try to tell my patients, think of it like dancing. Intercourse is a tango, but there's the cha-cha, there's the merengue, there's all the other ways that you can dance. And it doesn't mean you can't dance because you can't have intercourse. But now he's thinking, I can't go all the way, or I can't go all the way to the end of what sex should be before it's completed. And so now it's not a desire disorder. So we have to look at that. And then too, so he's not emotionally engaging. He has desire but it's not doing anything because he's not getting engaged and, and getting involved in sexual relations. So we have to tease all that apart to understand what's going on and where's the patient's problems really happening. So we find out, in fact, that patient probably has a normal testosterone and it's not a testosterone problem or a desire problem, but rather it's a problem with um, worry, anxiety, and not wanting to engage in sex because of that. And in fact, it's complicating his erectile dysfunction because now he's having sex less. And so his confidence in his erections is waning too, which is part of what we ask them on a shim or an IAF is about the confidence that they can have an erection. So this is really important information because anxiety produces adrenaline and adrenaline is part of fight or flight. And you can bet people the blood is going out of your penis and to your heart, to your muscles, to your brain if fight or flight kicks in, right? It's not going to stay in the penis. The penis is going to drop. There's no doubt about it. So this is really important to understand all these pieces. And with the female, when we see, is she having arousal disorder? Is the vagina responding? Well, she's menopausal, so she's not really lubricating, but it is uh, expanding, it's widening. But so we want to look at all these pieces because we fix the problem with erections and they come back and say, I'm still not having sex. But well, when you talk to the partners, they're like, why aren't you having sex? And she's like, well, I don't really like him. <laughs> okay. And that's why I do couple therapy at the VA too, because guess what? People still aren't having sex when they're like, I don't really want to be emotionally engaged with him because I don't even like him. That's a big problem, right? And it happens more often than you think. Do you know one out of five marriages are non-sexual? How many times a year do non-sexual um, marriages have sex? Less than 10, 10 times a year or less is a non-sexual marriage. That's what they call it. And one out of five marriages or relationships, God bless you, are non-sexual. So we know that's pretty, I'm going to scooch this just a little because I just keep tripping on it, walking back and forth. Okay, so we want to pull all that apart. Now when we ask people, this is a great study, Herbenic, Debbie Herbenick did in 2010, and they asked people, the last time you had sex, did you have any problems? We see again that one out of five roughly men struggle with erections, but actually almost 10% of them said they didn't, ha they didn't have an orgasm. So lots of things happening there. Um, to, to think about with our male patient. And then look, over a third of the women had some issues with lubrication, and almost a third reported pain with sex. Nine point, and this is not older women, this is 18 to 59. More than a third reported no orgasm. 
all these things are really important for us to understand because these are generally healthy people that they randomly chose out of the community and they're 18 to 59 and many, many people are having trouble with sexual function. I wanted to bring up the Princeton 3 because I think it's really important and even now more and more evidence is coming up to say there is a direct link, level A evidence, the best level. You saw the leveling from what um, Vic showed you. When we look at level A evidence it says there is a link between erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease. So you need to suspect cardiovascular disease in all your patients that you ferreted apart and determined they have physiologic erectile dysfunction. So their nighttime erections are disappearing. Their self-stimulation erections are disappearing. Now we know they have physiologic erectile dysfunction and so we want to look very carefully at them for cardiovascular risk. And so we say, well, can they have sex then if we're worried about cardiovascular risk? And how they tease that apart is exercise. Can they go up two flights of stairs without chest pain and tolerate it? Then they're probably safe to have sex. But do they need a further cardiovascular evaluation? That's what you have to think about. Have they ever had a resting EKG? And the ones that are most at risk, your 30 and 40 year old pretty healthy men, Princeton 3 says they are potentially a walking time bomb with cardiovascular disease with a risk of a stroke or a heart attack within the next two to seven years, average of three to four years. So you need to be looking very carefully. And sometimes my primary care in both of my clinics will give me pushback. Why do you want a resting EKG? Because they could have undetected Wolf Parkinson's white. They could have whatever, some sort of arrhythmia that you don't know about. Well, they exercise. They do a stress test all the time when they exercise. I don't care. People drop dead on the, on the basketball court, right? And this is what could happen. We need to know. What will it hurt to put all the leads on them? You can do it right in your office and see if they have any problems. I had a, a, uh, actually a cardiologist at Northwestern said, why did you insist on this? And I'm like, because this man had erectile dysfunction and the penis is the perfect barometer of overall cardiovascular health. And she's like, this guy had a widow maker and we never would have known that. My badge does not want to stay on me today at all. I don't know who I am today, but <laughs> um, anyway, so it, so you will find those things. Now, of course, they're few and far between, but why are you not going to check off that box? It's a very simple thing to do. So you do want to have resting EKGs, but you can see the evidence is there and it's mounting up more and more. So they say, we want to do a medical history. We want to know about can they tolerate exercise? And everybody knows if they can go up steps without, without heart, chest pain or heart uh, issues. Um, physical exam, we want to look at them. My urologists say all the time, you always have that stethoscope on. I'm like, I use that stethoscope with every patient. Kay works in my clinic. We use our stethoscopes in our clinic because we need to be evaluating these patients. Now, I'm not the greatest with the heart sounds. I'm not a cardiologist, but I'm listening and I can tell what's basically going on and if I find anything that I'm overly concerned about. But we do want to do a physical exam. It's somewhat focused. I want to check pulses, peripheral pulses. I want to check all those different things. Um, as well. We're going to check ED severity with an IEF, which is the International Index of Erectile Function, or a SHIM, either one. The SHIM is five questions, the other one is expanded. I told you about the resting EKG. We want to know about glucose, and a lot of us, our glucose is sometimes will run about 100, 105. That's not that unusual, but we want to know, is there an ongoing problem because diabetes affects nerve conduction and blood flow, both of which are the essential components of an erection. Serum creatinine level and albumin, we want to know a little bit about kidney function, things like that, and a lipid profile. These are the things that we want to look at. And yes, we do want to look at a testosterone, even though that's not typically the problem because the main thing with testosterone is sex drive, we still, the guidelines say we want to still look at a testosterone and honestly, I always, if I'm going to get a testosterone, I get a prolactin too, because unfortunately, I found quite a few hyperprolactinemias over the years. And so I like, why not? If you're going to get a total testosterone, let's get a prolactin as a screener. And then if I need more, I'm going to go back and do a free and total testosterone. I'm going to go back and do an LH and an FH, FSH to differentiate between primary and secondary hypogonadism and more things. But as a screener, a total
total testosterone and a prolactin. But those guidelines are important, Princeton 3. They're what we're held to. So you want to know there could be a cardiovascular risk. I wanted to talk a little bit about cancer in general because I see a lot of cancer patients. Of course I see prostate cancer patients, but I see breast cancer patients. I also see um, colorectal cancer patients. Those are probably the big three. But um, I see a lot of patients who have sexual dysfunction and we can see from the studies about 70% of patients after cancer treatment and all of these things are causing problems. Not just surgery in that area, but chemotherapy is a hormone manipulator. It is going to change things. So lots of things, plus the fact psychological issues with fatigue and, and different things like that. How are they going to mitigate this? And I can't tell you, I was just saying, how often I'll have a guy, he has cancer and she has a cancer too. Of course, most often his is prostate and hers is breast, but simultaneously they've been diagnosed recently. And this is a couple who's going to have some struggles with sexual dysfunction. So, and you can see lots of different things go wrong when things are not going, when they're on chemotherapy or they're having uh, treatment for cancer. Fertility is also really important, and this is a great study from Livestrong that says, and I bring this, I brought this to the oncology nurses because this was over 3,000 patients and 60% of the men and women were concerned. We can't assume at any age that they're not concerned about it, but 70% said nobody asked them about fertility, and we have to think about fertility before they have their cancer treatment. And they can even do retrieval of sperm, eggs, different things while they're in the hospital. But it has to be done ahead of time or we've closed that door for them. And that's not a door we should have the choice to close. So I think it's really, really important. And so when you look at the new guidelines from ASCO and NCCN, they both say you should be dealing with these things. And often it's not dealt with. And in fact, NCN NCCN has a wonderful algorithm for sexual dysfunction. Um, uh, you should go online and, and look at it. It's excellent. It says if they have this, do this. I mean, it's really got a lot of good suggestions for what to do for patients with sexual dysfunction. So we have lots of different therapies. We have lots of different things we can do for these patients. And I'm happy to answer questions or go delve deeper into all of these different things because, as I said, we could talk forever about this. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. But we do do some cognitive behavioral things because uh, think about it. So we showed a few years back that most of erectile dysfunction is physiologic. But do you think there's still a psychogenic component, component with every one of those patients? I do. There's no doubt. Because once you have a failure, now you think, oh, oh God. One, one patient said it's that oh gosh thing, or that oh golly, oh my god, it's that thinking that kills it. So it's like you think, you start to have sex and you think, what if I lose my erection? What does she think of me? What am I going to do? It's shrouded in shame and it's a big problem. So there's always a psychogenic overlay. So we have to teach them mindfulness, staying present, staying focused. They know how to focus on sex. They do it when they masturbate. Most of them aren't watching something when they're masturbating. They're mas you know, that's just not how most men are, are masturbating. They have a deck of things in their brain that they can pull up, sex, 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 sex. And so the thing is, is we tell them, while you're having sex, the minute you start to think, oh my gosh, or, and this is blunt, but, um, but one of my patients described it as the, oh shit. He said, I think, oh shit, and then, whoop, I'm killing it. And I'm just quoting what a patient said, but truly this is, and I thought that's a perfect description of it. So they start worrying about that erection and that erection is gonna go away. And I talked about why earlier. So you have to work on redirecting. I say your brain can work for evil or good, right? It can lead you in the wrong direction so you're losing erections, but you can redirect it back. So the minute you start to think, I want, oh, I love, you got a deck of things. Or anchor. Anchoring is what's happening. Look, listen, feel. It's exciting for these men to look, listen, feel, and know, oh, yeah, I'm having sex. My penis is in the vagina. This is a good thing. I mean, you're having sex. Why are you worrying? It's like, you told me you have sex once a month. Why are you worrying? You're like, you're supposed to be having fun. Remember, it's supposed to be fun. And that, so all these things are how we do mindfulness. We do anchoring. So there's no great mystery to what we do in terms of cognitive behavioral therapies, but those are the kinds of things that we do. It sounds, it's easy for me to say, 
don't worry while you're having sex. It's much more difficult for them to do, but they really can learn how to do it and it really can work. But that's the kinds of things that you're working on with these patients is redirecting the mind towards sex, sex, sex. And I say either stay with what's happening or go with what's exciting, but you gotta stay on sex and redirect your mind every time it slips off of sex onto anything else. So that's some of what we do. And of course, couples counseling with that couple who they don't get along. Even the men will tell me oftentimes, um, I have, I uh, will say, if I don't feel connected, sometimes it's difficult for me to have sex too. If I don't feel connected to my partner, if we have a disconnect. So that connection is really, really important. So we work on that connection so they feel more connected and so that they're comfortable with, with um, having sex and not losing, ere losing erections or her um, tightening up there because she's, she's anticipating sex and lots of different things we can do with cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling. Pelvic floor physical therapy, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. I'm gonna touch on some different things, but again, there's so much to talk about, we won't even touch on many of it. But um, anyway, and then we have hormones. You heard him talk about that. I'm not gonna talk more because Vic did a nice job of, uh, talking about testosterone, but I am gonna talk about some new products for women in terms of a DHEA local therapy um, that can be helpful, a vacuum, de vacuum devices for men and women, medicine, surgeries, we'll touch a little bit. Um, of course, you're asked about herbs all the time and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit too. So these patients, when Brene Brown, I love Brene Brown, and um, I use a lot of her, her work and her theory in my practice because Sexual dysfunction is shrouded in shame. Whether you realize it or not, it is. And so when, when Brene Brown said, what makes us feel vulnerable? And she's talked to tons of people all across the United States. And she says, one of the most vulnerable things is either asking for or being asked to have sex. That makes us feel very vulnerable. And it can be really difficult. And people with sexual dysfunction, men or women, they feel a lot of shame. There's no doubt about it. I've never told anybody, but we've been married for five years and we've never had intercourse. We haven't consummated our marriage. Uh, no one knows I have erectile dysfunction. My partner doesn't even know I take pills for erectile. You guys, have you taken care of people? It's like they don't tell their partner that, that you know. If you work with these patients, you know what I'm talking about. They are shrouded in shame, but shame hates when you talk about it. When you say, when you tell someone else, it dissipates shame. So it's very important um, that they have a chance. I can't tell you how many times I always ask people, have you ever had a, um, any kind of a traumatic or a bad experience with sex in the past? Sometimes patients are like, what does that mean? If they don't know what it means, then probably they haven't had it. That's the good news. But all too often, my patients know exactly what I mean. And I can't tell you how many times they'll tell me, Yes, and then they'll say something about what happened to them as a child or whatever, and then later they'll tell me, I've never told anybody that before. And they're 48 or they're 65 and they've never told another soul that they were molested. It comes up all the time. So we've got to deal with all those things because so, you know, patients will say all the time, geez, you ask so many questions and I move off them quickly and people will be like, why would you ask me about religious affiliation? Well, you all know why I would ask about that because sometimes that's exactly, think about, this is how it works for some of my patients. They've told me they have a certain sheet that they have in their marriage bed and there are people sitting on the other side of the door after they've gotten married waiting to come in and look at the sheet. Do you think that's gonna affect sex? Really? And then some of them can't consummate their marriage and different things are happening. So we have to know about everything. Now we quickly move on if they say it's such and such. And I did have two people in one day say, I'm just quoting patients, so this is not a jab at anything, but in one day two different people say, they were older people and they're like, well I was raised Catholic, don't you think I've had some traumatic things in my life? And I was like, <laughs> like that was really traumatic on my sex life. And I was like, wow. Um, but. But really, these things do live in our, in our bodies if we don't deal with them and know. You have to know that's part of who I am. That's part of what I learned. And it, and it gives me problems with sex or whatever. But vulnerability is scary. It's scary. We say, oh my gosh. I mean, as we get older, it's like you think it's not just losing things, it's losing people. I said to my wife, 
all we do is go to funerals and wakes, and it's like, this is crazy. I just had a coworker from the VA. Um, next week I have another, uh, another wake for, it's for another coworker, and I'm just like, gosh, this is just nuts. And sometimes you're just like, I don't want to feel the pain anymore, especially if you lose someone close to you, like a parent or a child or your partner. I think that can be really difficult. But so we say, okay, I don't want to feel it anymore. So we numb. Do you guys numb? Everybody numbs. I work. I work, 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 work. I work two jobs, 45 hours a week, and then I come do this on the weekend, and actually I have to leave here and go back to Prom Girls Rock, where I'm doing a prom dress giveaway with my wife. It's like her favorite thing in the world, and it happened to be the same day as we're here. And then I went to Iowa Wednesday, um, and I did a talk there. I flew in and flew out, and here I am again. And then I'm on the Simon Foundation, and I do a bunch of stuff because we're doing a disclosure project. And I'm on the board of us, too. And so I numb. Um, who has a credit card in their wallet? Do you use that to numb? I feel really crappy. I'm going to go buy myself a new purse. <laughs> That's my wife's solution. She's like, a new purse will solve a lot of problems. You know? Or she's like, or even better, some sort of bling, some jewelry, you know? So whatever, we all numb. Some use alcohol, some use exercise, whatever. But the problem is you can't selectively numb. So when you numb, you numb it all. And vulnerability is the path to love and creativity and connectedness. Make no mistake, it's the only path. So you cannot numb. And it's really difficult. And when those difficult things come, what happens is we think, okay, I have a loss, I'm gonna go around it, and I'm gonna go this way. But then it props up its head in some ugly way later. Trust me, unless you go through it, you didn't deal with it, and it ain't going away. So all these things are things that sometimes we have to unearth in the clinic and see what's going on. But vulnerability is a really important thing because it's a big part of sex and intimacy. So we say to the patient, here's the whole thing. Well, the urologist told me to come see you because he said, I need to do these shots. I can't stand needles. But he said, you got to come do this with, with Dr. Alba. That's what you're going to do. This happens all the time in my clinic. But the thing is, is what, are the, what is the patient's goal? It doesn't matter what the urologist, what the primary care, what whoever said to you. What I think, none of it matters. And ideally, bring your partner with you. I always say, if you guys get along and you, and you can come together, please bring your partner, partners, whatever. And actually, I've had people who are like, um, well, there's three of us. And I'm like, okay, do you all get along? Yes then all three come in. And they're all going to be in my clinic, and we're going to talk about how's it going, what's happening, how's it going to work for you. I love this because we get two very different opinions, right? Because sometimes he'll say, well, I rate my erection at a two. And she's like, no, it's a four. Or sometimes the reverse. But we do get the whole picture between the two people. Well, I think I have trouble with erections probably about 90% of the time. She's like, no, it's more like 50. Or, yeah, she says it's 90% of the time. But we want to know all those things. And then she says, I have told him over and over, intercourse and penetration do not matter to me. It hurts. I went through menopause. Um, I tried the estradiol cream. I hate it. I don't want to do it. And so I don't want to have intercourse. And he says, she's just saying that she's trying to be nice because I have erectile dysfunction. And she's like, that's not why I'm saying this. So you, you have to have both sides of the picture, right? Um, and then you have people who, and then the urologists say, well, after prostate cancer, these patients have erections. And then the patients are like, you call that an erection? I mean, how do you work with that? And she's like, I don't know what to do with that kind of erection. Yeah, it's a tiny bit hard, but she's like, what am I supposed to do? And the uro I, I swear this urologist told me once, he said, <clears throat> it is an erection. I'm like, well, how do you use it? And he goes, it's a stuffable erection. <laughs> I said, wow, what does she do? Stand on her head and you stuff it in or something? I don't understand how that works. I mean, gosh, and at our age, nobody's standing on their head, and, you know, so it's like, really? <clears throat> but so what are their goals? Because that's all we care about is their goals. And that's really, really important. Their goals. Their goal is I want to feel connected. I want to have pleasure. But just the thought of him pulling out the vacuum pump makes my blood pressure go up 20 points. You're not having fun then. Or I think, okay, we got to do this. All right, honey. Um, 
the only way it will work is if I'm in this position. So um, I've got to be standing. And so you bend over. Now we'll put three pillows here and then, you know, and then the trapeze comes down and then we're going <laughs> to... I mean, really? What are their goals? What do they want? You can have connected this. And then they'll say, I can't have spontaneity because I, you know, I have to use the vacuum pump. Okay, well, if you're in the middle of wherever and there is nobody around, you're at this romantic waterfall and you're wanting to have sex and you forgot your shot or you forgot your vacuum pump, can you have some awesome sex? And I hope you do. Yes, hello. You don't have to have intercourse. You can have connectedness. You can have pleasure. You can have orgasms, whether the penis is hard or not. A woman no more needs a hard penis than the man on the moon needs one to walk on to have an orgasm. That's the truth. The clitoris is not up in the vagina, and the clitoris and the penis start from the same embryonic origin, right? They do, it's a fact. So one turns into the clitoris with the same cylinders and all the same structures inside. Do you think for a minute that that is not the main source of pleasure, just like the penis is the main source of pleasure for a man? So you don't need a hard penis. And the man doesn't need a hard penis because it's wired separately when you get down below. And most men have erectile dysfunction for vasculogenic reasons. And even when it's neurogenic, it's often the cavernosal nerve from being pulled off of the, of the prostate not the pedundal nerves which give you an orgasm. So most men with erectile dysfunction can climax fine. And they'll say to you that they can, but sometimes they think, oh, well, if I'm harder, I'll climax better, but that's not true. Now it does give them a little more to work with, but the bottom line is they're gonna have a climax whether they're hard or not. It doesn't matter. So nobody needs a hard erection for an orgasm, connectedness, and pleasure. I spend a lot of time getting them to understand this really important information because that can, now we can take intercourse off the table to begin with and say, okay, everybody's blood pressure is up here when you take the blue pill or you do whatever. So we're not having intercourse anymore. In fact, it's off limits. Now, erections start coming back around. Things start going better because nobody's freaking out or worried about it. And everybody's getting connectedness, pleasure, and orgasms. So that's sensate focus. That's another thing that we do with patients. But what are their goals? And so I wanted you to understand all that and I spend a lot of time helping my patients understand that because in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, when people are having sex, men, do people have sex in their 70s, 80s, and 90s? The majority do. Do men or women, do men have it more than women or women more than men or is it equal? Men are more likely to still continue to have sex as they get older than women, but women have, have a tenth of the testosterone and then it wanes after menopause and they have vaginal dryness and they have atrophy and that's over 50% of them. And that's why sometimes women aren't having sex as much as men are in their older years, but they can and they do enjoy it, but it's not always enjoyable to have penetration. 70 year olds, we already have got 70% of erectile dysfunction. So older adults are having outer course. They're having non-penetrative sex and it's a perfectly good option for your patients. What are their goals and how can we get them there? So that's really what we want to know and we can't help them unless we know. Oops, there it goes. All right, so pelvic floor physical therapy. So, there's, so when women come in and the number one complaint, even though desire is the number one problem for men and women between age 18 and 59, number one problem for both men and women, desire doesn't bring people in because when you don't have a desire, it affects your motivation. And you're like, well, I don't have a desire, but so what? You know, right? That's how it goes. I don't have a desire, but I certainly don't have a desire. Men, I hate to go to the doctor. You think I'm gonna to go to the doctor for a desire disorder? When I, women, same thing. So desire doesn't always bring them in. It does sometimes, but it's not the main thing. But pain brings them in. This is not the main reason for pain. The main reason for pain is hormonal. You have a 24-year-old patient. She comes in and she's like, it really hurts when I have sex, it really hurts. What is the huge question you're gonna ask her? Do you what? Do you take oral birth control or any kind of hormonal birth control? And what, di what age did you start? Because you're at a 300% greater chance of having dyspareunia or pain if you started before the age of 17. And remember, a lot of them started for period regulation and things like that. But definitely, that person probably has a hormone-mediated dyspareunia or pain with penetration. And so we're going to start looking there first. 
But once you've had pain there, even a UTI, and probably many people in the room have had a UTI, you start clenching there because you're like, oh God, the, the pain of urinating. You go to urinate and you're like, ugh. And these women clench too. So often they need pelvic floor physical therapy for high tone pelvic floor as well as hormonal treatment. A lot of times we have to do mo both. But make no mistake, I put a lot of young women on estradiol, either cream, uh, the pellet or the ring, local estrogen to try and um, fix the hormonal problem and then we almost always do physical therapy because we have incredible rates of success is what the research shows with pelvic floor physical therapy for high tone pelvic floor which is the second most common reason for dyspareunia or pain with penetration. And make no mistake, these women are telling you when I put the tampon in, the exam, it's all miserable. Anything in the vagina is uncomfortable. So that's what we'll find. How can you differentiate between it's hormonal or it's this? There's a great way to do it. When you're doing your manual exam, here is the vagina with the, the person's facing this way. So the posterior wall of the vagina, especially down here from about five o'clock to about eight o'clock, right in there, that's where the pain will live if it's muscular specifically. It will be everywhere when it's hormonal because everything will hurt. And in fact, when you touch with a light Q-tip around between heart's, ring, heart's, uh, heart's line, which is just outside of it, and the hymenal ring. So the hymenal ring is the vaginal introitus where, where things go in. And then about this far out from it, there's a line called heart's line. And that area is where they'll be very, very tender. We call that area the vestibule. It's easy to remember because just like a church, it's before you go in, it's before the, the introitus, there's the vestibule area. When you separate the labia and you look at that pink area in between there, you'll see, and sometimes, I swear to you, sometimes that line, you'll literally be like, oh my God, there is that line that Dr. Almo talked about. And you'll see it and you'll be like, right between there and the opening, that's where the pain mostly exists because um, that's the vestibule. And that's why, believe it or not, sometimes it's so bad they have to remove the, uh, the top tissue and do a vestibulectomy there. Um, but oftentimes we can fix that, and that's got endoderm. So sometimes we have to use not only estrogen in those patients, but we have to use, um, we also have to use um, testosterone, because endoderm wants testosterone, not just estrogen. But I can talk more about that, and that's, of course, off-label, non-FDA approved. Oral agents, we can talk, all you want about them. Um, basically, you know you have to do patient teaching with these. Even though this is the one that most often food and fat affects, patients over and over in my clinic, and I'm sure in all of your clinics say, if I have a heavy meal, definitely it will affect absorption of these drugs. So they want to take it on an empty stomach. They want to take it at, for these an hour ahead of time. For this one, about 30, 45 minutes. It cuts it in half, but an hour, hour and a half ahead of time. Lots of things. If you have questions about it, there's lots of different things we do to help them understand how to take it for the best effect. Um, but they do work in, with people with true physiologic erectile dysfunction, probably in about 65%, 60 to 70% of men. Um, I do use this with psychogenic patients too to build back their confidence. Um, I'll do a very low dose and you can do sildenafil 20 milligram generic tablets, which is Revatio, but sildenafil, sildenafil for about 30 cents to 50 cents a piece with a good RX prescription. I use it in both my clinics all the time because it's so cheap. A bottle of 90 for about 30 bucks with a good RX coupon. Um, they can go to their local pharmacy. Most of them participate in that. Um, and then they can get it really cheaply. And I can have a very low dose that they could even split in half and use it for confidence building and getting better erections when they're struggling with erections. And literally, God bless him, I had a 17 year old whose mother had to come in and sign for him because he was having erectile dysfunction. And I was like, you are a rock star. That you told your mother and she brought you here is like, I could never have done that at 17. I'm like, that is amazing. But literally, these, these people are struggling. And make no mistake, they are struggling a lot of times, 80, 90% of the time that they're trying to have sex once they get into that mindset of, oh my gosh, what's my penis doing? Uh, what's she think of me? You know, being a 17-year-old is a hideous prospect anyway, right? And then on top of it, you're worried about your erections. So, um, yes, we do use this for all kinds of different things, and I do have pretty good luck with it. Remember, there's lots of things, like if they've had a heart attack in the last six, six months, you don't. And can they tolerate going up the steps um, if they use nitroglycerin? There's lots of things, and I can answer any of those questions. 
Certainly, the thing we do so well and why we're so good at sexual dysfunction is because as nurses, our paradigm, our world exists with patient teaching and advocacy. And first and foremost, even though I'm a prescriber and, and even though I am a provider and can do all that stuff, I am a nurse. And so what I teach people to do is integrate this into their life. You can just imagine, you know, now it's time for sex, you got a new partner and you pull out this little gun, right? <laughs> So how do you integrate that into love play? Well, some people will do it together with their partner. Their partner will do it with them and they'll, and they'll kind of work on, she'll pump while he does what, you know, different things like that. Sometimes he'll have this band on the device sitting next to the bed and then he'll reach over and do whatever. Sometimes he'll go, some men like to step away and go to the bathroom. Some men like to have this done before they walk in. They've got 30 minutes after it's on, but my job is to help them integrate it into love play. And the problem is, is you got to think about that. Because if you give them a prescription, the failure rates are going to be 80% unless you do all the teaching. Gene Lewis from uh, the Minneapolis VA said, you are the injection king and you have a bias against this. You don't like the vacuum pump. And I'm like, that is not true. I present everything equally and I am good with this. And she's like, you're full of baloney. She goes, how many times have you worked with the patient with this thing? In the office, pulled it out, got the lubricant, the whole nine yards. I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> I'm like, I tell them what to do, but I don't want to, like, no, why, why do you do that? And she's like, that's why you don't like it. And I said, well, that's probably true. So I started working with patients with it. When they had difficulty, they'd bring it in, and I started really working with them. And actually, one of my reps go, you know more tricks than anything I've ever seen with that vacuum pump. Well, I better know more tricks than anything you've ever seen because I'm the one who has to help that patient and you have to teach them those tricks. But I will tell you in my clinic, this is absolutely, it works. It is very rare that if they come in and work with me, we can't get it to work. It's got all kinds of issues. It's cumbersome, it's awkward. The penis feels um, a little cool to the touch after so long because the blood not moving back and forth. It can be a little pinkish purplish. You have to guide it in in the beginning because erections are rooted in your body by the corpora uh, cavernosa and the corpora spongiosum. But this doesn't root, it stops where the ring is. There's issues, but does it work? Yes. I had one patient go, I don't get it. I'll come into your clinic and talk to people about it. It works great. I was like, I still need you to do penile rehab. I want it to get better. And he's like, I'm not worried about any of that crap. I got this thing and it's great. I'm like, wow, I haven't had anybody quite that big of an advocate of it, but he was. But it is true. It does work and it's non-invasive and you can use it right along with your pills. You can do all kinds of things with it, but there's lots of little things that I do to get this to work. I tell pe people every single day you will practice and be patient with the vacuum pump. You won't even touch the ring till you perfect a painless, even lifted off erection inside the pump and then you'll start with the loosest ring and work your way down. You use lots of lubricant with it, lots of different things we do. I say when you think you've practiced and been patient, you're going to do even more practice and patience. And then, yes, it will probably work and you can decide do you like it or don't you like it. But lots of little clues to how to do that. Injections, and yes, I have published a ton of thing on injections. Um, I do, uh, I don't, I tell every patient, it is not my job to persuade or dissuade you on anything. And I don't persuade them at all about injections. I say, here is the good, bad, and ugly. And I also lay it out in my book. And if you're, and the original book came out in 2012. And I, have, I really do have no disclosures. I know it says on there I do, but I haven't done anything for those companies for a gazillion years. Because I do research, I don't do anything with industry anymore like that at all. Um, because I just don't want to deal with that. And with this book, I've never made a single penny. In fact, it's cost me a lot of money. Last month it cost me money because I had to go to Greenville and Charleston and I had to pay for my own way and do all my own thing. But bottom line is the original book can be downloaded completely free on my website at www.drjeffalbaugh.com. The new book will be there eventually, but they can order this. We've made it as cheap as we can with shipping and everything. They can get it on Amazon or there. But the bottom line is all I try to do is lay out the research and what patients say the good, bad, and ugly of it is, period. You decide what you want to do. 
And that's what that new AUA guidelines say. Give them all the information they need, empower them to make their own decision. And that's all I do in my clinic. I never say you should, you ought to, you shouldn't. You, I say, what do you want to do? Once in a while, I'll push somebody because I can see they're very miserable and injections seem like they're a good idea for, to help them move forward in their journey. I have a few patients, but I can probably count them on one hand that I was like, I think it might really change things for you. Let's just see what you think. But mostly, I don't push at all for, the, for any of these things. I do push the vacuum pump a little bit because it's non-invasive and it's not that expensive, and I like to use it for rehab if the pills aren't doing enough. But anyway, so, but I do say it, it's always your choice. And if you don't want to do anything, that's absolutely fine. This is the female pump, and so we use this with patients. This goes over the clitoris, and so um, it does have some really good results. It's not super expensive, and it's not covered by insurance, but it does work, especially for your patients who have had some sort of surgery down there um, and have some vaginal stenosis and, and lack of arousal and lubrication. It can be helpful. They use it daily to pull blood down into the area over the clitoris, um, it's called, and so that can be helpful as well. And you can see the results are pretty good with increasing orgasm, lubrication, sexual satisfaction. I talked a little bit about local estrogen, not systemic estrogen, and we even use that in breast cancer patients because I see a lot of breast cancer patients. When I see women, they're often breast cancer patients. And so, um, and sometimes they don't want to talk about estrogen, and I don't make anybody do anything. I talk to them about non-hormonal things, but they can take it. And what that basically shows you is there is research to say I can usually get their oncologist and their gynecologist on board if they want to. And I had one woman who said, you know, Dr. Albaugh, it feels like a knife going in my vagina. The penis literally feels like a knife. And I am 53 years old and I am not going to live like this. That patient certainly is somebody that we're gonna probably use this on. Even if they had an estrogen dependent breast cancer, the, usually it, they find that it is safe and it usually doesn't cause them any issues. And like she said, I will not live like this. I will not live this way, it is miserable. I'm a wife, I wanna feel like a woman, and I'm not gonna live this way. Um, she was on a hormone manipulator after her breast cancer uh, initial treatment, and so, it can be safe to do. And basically, all I wanted to show you here was the Cochrane Review says all of them work equally well. The ring, the, um, the pellet, and these are all local estrogen, or the cream. I always teach them with the cream. Put a little on the pad of your finger if you don't like the applicator, because that can be painful for them. And then they just put it just inside the introitus and just outside, and then wash your hands. Good to get it off your hands. And a lot of people like to do it that way. And once they're established on it, they use it twice a week. A little goes a long way, but it does work well. But here's some of my non-hormonal things. I just wanted to give you just a few. This was developed by an Asian gynecologist, but I use all these different things, plus even more things. So if you want to know more ideas, I'm happy to share all my ideas with you. But they need a vaginal moisturizer, not a lubricant. Lubricants are for friction, but you actually want a moisturizer, like you moisturize your hands that you use regularly a couple times a week. And there's lots of different people who make them, and they go up in price depending on how hypoallergenic and all these things, but there's tons of different options, um, and I use lots of different things. And I also do have them use lubricant for friction during sex, but moisturizers and lubricants are, both have a necessity in those patients. So this is a CIRM. It is not an estrogen, it, it is an estrogen therapy, but it's not an estrogen. So it's another way that we can treat um, that local uh, dyspareunia problem without using estrogen. And so this was a new product that was introduced and we're very excited to have something that's not that way. It'll still have the same scary things in there, but make no mistake, this is not an estrogen product, so, um, so patients can sometimes feel safer using something like that. This is the newest thing on the horizon, and so I wanted to real briefly just talk about, this is a vaginal DHEA, uh, it's a synthetic, and so basically what happens is studies showed a significant reduction in scores on dis, of dyspareunia, and so another way to treat it without using um, estrogen, no increase in estrogen or testosterone, and the most common side effect was vaginal discharge because it has a little coloring to it, but, um, and they use 
6.5 milligrams daily. And um, so this is exciting that we have some things for female sexual dysfunction finally. And so this is a, a really exciting new medication that we're using. This is another oral medication that they have to take every day and it's specifically for desire or lack of, of sex drive. And so it's called Phlebanterin or Addy. Remember they have to sign a contract with you and the pharmacist that says they will never drink alcohol because the combination can lower their blood pressure. And they do have to take it every single day. Day. Sometimes we have trouble with coverage, but the company will help with that sometimes. So you can get it covered, but again, they have to agree to absolutely no alcohol at any time, and a lot of people are not real thrilled about that part. But um, it is the only drug that we have that works in the central nervous system to kind of increase dopamine and do some things to move the patient along. And you can see um, it's not like earth shaking, because when you give somebody a placebo pill for sex and you say it's for sexual desire, they're going to have more desire. So the placebo arms are often high in these studies and this is why we had to fight to get this out of the um, FDA and actually the FDA came back and decided that yes they would approve this after they initially didn't approve it. Even though there was tons of research to show safety big time and efficacy um, but we do other things for desire disorders. Sensate focus, I talked a little about simmering, reading erotica, reading romance, reading fantasy. All of it's got sex in it, and it can work pretty well to help with desire. Um, I wanted to talk just a minute on rejuvenation therapy because we're supposed to be talking about the new things. And you know in Chicago there's billboards. In the Sun-Times, literally it had stem cell and it looked like it was part of the Sun-Times. But if you read real little, it said paid advertisement. So we know there are chop shops all over. New Mail, Boston Medical, Cambridge Medical. And trust me, your patients, like my patients, are going to them. And they're taking blood out of their arm and doing this pee shot where they stick it into their penis. And remember, that's never been done in human trials. So it is neither safe nor effective. And they should never be doing that one in particular when it's never even been tested in humans to determine is it safe or effective. But they're doing it all over the country in these chop shops. Make no mistake about it. I just saw a patient in the VA the other day who said, oh yeah, I had the pee shot. I never told anybody that, but I did. It didn't do anything because um, it usually doesn't work. It has to be done properly. But there is some exciting things happening with both ultrasound and with stem cells. And, and this is a wonderful time because they're beginning the human trials. They just started. But you should never be doing these in one of those clinics that will do it for thousands of dollars, multiple therapy when you're done, ten to fifteen thousand dollars or so for these therapies that are not approved in human beings. So the AUA, the FDA, everybody says they should only be done under IRB. And remember, Mostly what they're finding with stem cells is it's helping people with vasculogenic, which is the most common reason for erectile dysfunction. So is that going to help somebody after prostate surgery or radiation? No, because there's, they're having vasculogenic problems, but their primary problem is neurogenic. So the studies aren't showing whether it'll help them or not. They don't know how much, how little, how often with either the ultrasound or the stem cells. But I do believe the stem cells and, and the ultrasound may eventually have a big role. And I really do think the stem cells will. And I just wanted to show you the studies about that. Um, that there are studies that it was started with science and there is science for it, but it is not ready for rollout, but it's been rolled out. Make no mistake about it. Your patients are doing this. The animal studies are promising, but we absolutely know we do not respond the same as animals do, so you should not be doing this unless it's an IR proof proof study and there's only a couple around the country for the stem cells and the ultrasound that are IRB approved. Here's the um, shock wave and again there's not there's there's one but it's not a randomized control trial with these patients. These are the patients that are mostly asking me about it and they're probably asking you and there's nothing that says it will help them. You can see the IAF scores with this one little study and it's really not significant. It's really not shown to be helpful. So they shouldn't be doing this ultrasound and you should not be doing it in your clinic. Maybe your providers think it's okay, but guess what? It's not. It's not to be done unless it's not FDA approved. It's not to be done unless they're in an IRB. If you're doing a study, that's a whole different thing. If you're doing these things outside of a study, you're breaking the AUA guidelines, you're breaking the SMSNA guidelines, you are doing something that should not be done. So I wouldn't want to be a part of it. Um, 
Here's just some resources for patients. I have free videos for men and women both at northshore.org if they put in my name in sexual health. I told you they can download the whole book for free, the original book, and soon we'll have the new book for them. I love some of these other guidelines from uh, middle sexes for women, but lots of different things that might help your patients. So you know it's common. I just wanted to leave the last minute or two for you to ask questions or if you want me to tell you more about things. Um, but basically, um, you get the idea from what I'm saying. It's a common problem. Your patients desperately need your help. If you think you're going to offend them, there's no way in the universe. Most of them, I can't tell you how many take my hands and are just like, thank God somebody is talking to me about this. They are so thrilled you're talking to them about it. So you are, they need you desperately. And you as a nurse are their most trusted resource. And so you are the person that I think they most often will turn to. It is a wonderful field to work in. So I highly, highly encourage you to help your men and women with sexual dysfunction. And I'll entertain your questions quickly, but thank you so much for your time and attention. <laughs> questions, any brave souls? Because everybody's scared to ask a question about sexual dysfunction. <laughs> yes? Again, another thing that has not been FDA approved, or, or, but a lot of people do use it. So she's asking about the Mona Lisa, and it's again a rejuvenation therapy, and we do not. But I do know people all across the country that do. It's still being really looked at in trials, and it's very controversial. Um, so um, we don't do it. Do you guys do it in your clinic? Some, there are quite a few clinics that do. It's not quite, quite like those things that I was showing you. But it is still, it falls into that category. So I don't think that uh, it's really supported by like um, AUA and things like that. But, but I have a lot of friends that their clinics use it. Um, but it is another form of rejuvenation therapy. They use the Mona Lisa um, for vaginal dryness, atrophy. And, and the thought with rejuvenation therapy, so you understand it is, if we, if we damage the cells and they rejuvenate, they'll come back um, and they may work better. And that's what they do with the ultrasound and that's what they're trying to do with stem cells. And the Mona Lisa, same thing. They're trying to cause um, superficial tissue damage to rejuvenate healthy growth back. And there is definitely, just like with ultrasound, there's beginning studies, not enough information that says it could help some people. And honestly, one thing I will say is the Mona Lisa has the best um, that I know of has the best research out there to support it, which is good, because there is research that does support it, but it's still kind of under investigation. Are you guys having success with it? And, and we, I do hear about a pretty good success with that for vaginal rejuvenation. Make sense? So it's not, it's still a little bit of a tricky wicket, um, and I don't know if Ishwish has taken a stance on it. I'm not sure. I'd have to look and see if they've written a white paper to say whether they support it or not, but I sure know a lot of people out there who are doing that rejuvenation therapy with that particular device. Other questions?